Good afternoon and welcome to this City Forum webinar. Please ask any questions via the chat function throughout the event. I would now like to hand you over to City Forum Chairman Mark Lee, who will begin the session. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be able to welcome you to the first of this group of digital forensic discussions. We worked in the subject area uh, sort of earlier before the, the dread lockdown happened and were um, embarked uh, on um, discussions in, 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 a, in a sector that I think is particularly sort of, sort of interesting and where our earlier work was regarded with, um, uh, with enthusiasm by those who participated in it. We're on this um, series doing two uh, sessions that are virtual and then we're doing a full um, sort of, uh, sort of day to, sort of, to complete the project. Uh, we work um, with a number of uh, corporates who are helpful to us, and today we're particularly grateful to Magnet Forensics, IBM, and SCC for uh, their involvement. But overall in our series, BT are with us, Kaki is with us, Forensics and Forensic Analytics, Mobilize, Siacom, Softcat and Cytec, who are playing different roles in uh, the, 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 the work that we shall be doing. And without this sort of sponsorship support, we wouldn't be able to, um, uh, to sort of operate. And we're extremely grateful for, for the help that we've been, we've been given. Uh, we prepare these forums very carefully over a very long period. And we've spoken to Joe Ashworth, Paul Gibson, uh, on a number of occasions in leading up to, to uh, this particular discussion today. And we've also uh, had sort of conversations in the sort of home office and else, elsewhere. And we're very grateful to uh, the officials who've supported us in developing uh, this program so that it handles the subjects that uh, people in official capacities really think need to be investigated and where we can do something that is perhaps useful in the direction of problem solving rather than problem polishing. Uh, we are grateful uh, to, for, for, to Craig Mackey for uh, sort of chairing us. I think he's one of the outstanding public servants of recent generations. We're delighted to have you uh, in the chair again, Craig. When you're here, we're, uh, we feel safe and quiet the moment we see you. Anyway, thank you for helping us in uh, pre preparing the program and in guiding us today. Uh, Craig will speak, and Daryl Preston uh, will be giving the, 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 the view of a police and crime commissioner, and we're most grateful uh, to you, Daryl, and I enjoyed our preparatory conversation several weeks ago. We were to have had a, a contribution then by Ian Livingston, but he can't be uh, sort of with us, and ACC Andy Freeburn uh, from Police Scotland will be speaking about transformation as it's seen in, in, in Scotland and where digital forensics speak, uh, fit, uh, fit, fits in. Uh, Nick Dean then appears, and we're delighted to have you with us. Uh, so Nick, you're appearing twice. You're in the plenary part of this and then starting off the uh, discussion session in, in the second sort of part of, of, the, of, of the day. We're also delighted to have uh, Nina Sunday from Norway sort of with us and a, an old friend of City Forum returning to our platform, Giles Herdale. Excellent to have you with us, Giles. I'm de delighted you're on, our, you're on our platform. A near namesake of mine, Mark Lees for Digital Magnet Forensics uh, will be, um, uh, will be uh, speaking for us as well. And we've been most grateful to Bethan Page Jones for coming in to th this session, she squeezed us into her diary, and and, and and we're most grateful to Bethan for 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 coming. And we shall have um, short speeches, which are on the record. They will be guided by um, by by Greg, and then we go into an off the record uh, session, also guided by 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 Greg, when Nick returns to make opening comments. We look forward to a, a good afternoon. There is a further session to come virtually on the 17th of May and on the 22nd of June, uh, BT will be hosting us in London for what is an exceptional day for us, a return to uh, sort of 
real world world work in real places with real people. Very glad to have you all with us and hope that this is a really good session this afternoon. And to our sponsors, thank you very much. To our panelists, thank you very much. And to Craig for sort of guiding us as ever. Even many more thanks, Craig. Thank you, Mark. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining this afternoon. And, and just a couple of uh, housekeeping points as, as Mark touched on there. You can at any time during this event feed questions into me and I'll feed them into the second part when we get a chance to ask questions. During this first part, you'll only see us. You'll see the person who's talking um, and uh, the participants. Um, in the second part, we'll open it up. The first part is recorded and is on the record. The second part gives a chance for more Chatham House open conversations. And just to emphasize a couple of points that, that Mark and others have, have sought with this, I will push all of us to, to think about solutions as well. Um, it's very easy in this space to describe the size and scale of the problem and the dynamics of the challenge and sort of go away with a collective woe is me. Actually, part of today is saying, well, how do we move from a woe is me to, to what we need to do and where we need to go? And probably to, to set the scene, uh, just sort of why is this important? Those of you working in policing, and I no longer work in policing, know how critical this is day in, day out to communities across the UK and further afield. I think back to 40 plus years ago when I started out in policing, the notion of having to gather digital evidence hadn't been heard of. And you were really unlucky if you got a job with some CCTV from a shop, shop somewhere. And that was about the limit of the evidence you had to deal with. The officers, the staff working this evening in towns and cities and villages across the country deal with digital evidence on a daily basis and struggle with volumes, prioritization, what they can do, what they can't do, of interoperability between systems, whatever it is, it seems to be a constant area that people struggle with. So with that in mind, what, what, how do we need to look at this? Well, the framework I've always tried to use is try and look in three lenses at this, try and look at the capabilities we're going to need for the future. What is the tech we're gonna need? What are the skills? What are the people and how are we going to use them? Then what are we going to do about the capacity? How do we get those? Because I'm sure at some point this afternoon, we'll all discuss capacity issues and we'll talk about that fixed question of how we have to either prioritize or, or arbitrate around different demands coming into the system. So how do we cope with that and how do we deal with that capacity? And is it all right in our system and model that a local force, force A, has got all the system and kit it needs and force B next door can't afford it or can't do it? And how do we cope with those differences uh, as we go forward? Those are some of the things that will absolutely resonate in that capability space. And then in that wider system space, we'll touch a lot on this afternoon and Invariably, we'll talk about tech and people will talk about tech solutions. And if you're like me at the moment, it seems that tech will say to you, don't worry, the fourth industrial revolution is on the way. AI is just around the corner, machine learning, bots. We will solve everything. And then you go, actually, can we do that legally? Do we have a framework to do some of this? And even if we could, is that ethical and the right thing to do? And we'll have some of that as we listen today to some of those tests that we'll all face as we go forward with this. So getting those systems right to support the capacity and capability is, is, is as important as the tech issues that we face for the future. So what are my three areas? I think if you said to me, what would I focus on now? Very strong focus on the ethics and the ability to be able to do these things and techniques with the support of the public we serve. Never more so has the issues around policing had a public face than it has at the moment, um, and in crucial to maintain public support in what we do and how we do it. And that's not an easy thing to do, because there are competing voices and competing 
uh, demands in this space. So that ethical debate for me will be important. Both data standards and standards. How do we do digital forensics to a standard that we can accredit and agree that is the same whether I do it in the north of Scotland, Camborne in Cornwall, or the far side of Kent? How do we do that? And what are the standards that we do to it? And that probably requires policing to start to think in a different way about how data is used and data standards it applies to itself. How does it do it and what does it do around this? And probably my third one for me is very much around how do we train people to bring them forward with us? And that's particularly uh, officers and staff because it's vital as we work with private sector companies and other organizations that we can truly be that intelligent customer who describe what we need, know what we need as the business, and can dictate what we need and what we need for the future. So really, for me, getting that balance right between is the work around digital forensic tech-led, is it business-led, is it academic-led, or is it a mix of all three, will be crucial to how we go forward for the future. I just wanted to set the scene in that way, but I'm now going to open it up to colleagues who are, who are wrestling with this on a daily basis and are doing some of the very things that we're going to work through. So without further ado, I'd like to go to, to Daryl Preston, who's the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners lead on uh, digital forensics and forensics. Daryl, welcome. Thank you very much, Craig, and a uh, good afternoon to everybody online. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, just a little bit about me. I know you've had the, the bio, but my background is in law enforcement. And Craig, who stole my thunder there a little bit, when I joined the police in 1985, I think we might have had ZX81s and Atari consoles, but digital forensics was not a thing. Uh, and in fact, I, I reflect, I don't think it really became a thing uh, until very recently. Uh, we had high-tech crime units who dealt with computers uh, and the occasional mobile phone. Uh, but when I, I, I left the police, so I, I joined the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners as a senior policy officer. Uh, I find myself in, in the buildings here today as well. Uh, and I dealt with lots of things there. I had serious organised crime, uh, cyber crime, economic fraud, etc., serious violence. But, but one little area that I was given, just one small area to look after, uh, was forensics. Uh, I think it's fair to say that forensics took up around 95% of my time. And, and the three key issues, the three key issues that we have in, in the broader forensics, including traditional and, and digital, was uh, the marketplace. And Craig, you talked about the intelligent client and the provision of supplier forensic services, um, accreditation, of, of our forensic services, very relevant uh, to digital. And the third standalone was digital forensics itself uh, and the very massive implications that that brings with it. Um, so what is the role of the police and crime commissioner? Uh, well, fundamentally, uh, we are the voice of the public in policing in England and Wales. And I make that distinction because I know we have colleagues from, from Scotland with us today as well. So, so what would the concerns of PCCs be? The question, APC positioning on digital forensics. Well, Craig, as you mentioned, what we do know now is that almost all crimes have a digital footprint, and that's a step change. And interestingly for me, we think about you know, computers, phones, but I, I've been given examples of things like smart fridges, uh, for example. Um, but the key thing here for police and crime commissioners is victims, witnesses and the wider public, because that's what this is all about, making our communities safe. And when drilling down on this, and when we particularly look at uh, digital uh, forensics and, and the provision and, and the recovery of evidence, there are a couple of very significant issues that we've had. And I know that, that Chief Constable Nick Dean will come on later and tell us exactly what's being done to deal with this. So it won't steal any of that thunder. But those significant issues, well, it's volume. I think we know that we saw a report from Channel 4 back in February that there are 20,000 devices outstanding, ready, waiting to be examined. 
that's 20,000 victims of crime. And because of the nature of, of, of these examinations, they will often be serious crime and they will often be rape and other serious sexual offences. So from a police and crime commissioner perspective, that clearly is of great concern. Uh, the other issue that we found as police and crime commissioners was the way those examinations of these devices were being carried out. Uh, in that firstly, devices were, were taken away from victims and witnesses for significant amount of time. And then we had perhaps what some would refer to as trawling of people's personal information. And I know that a number of discussions were had between colleagues in Home Office, Ministry of Justice, policing, to ensure that only that information that's required for proper justice to be carried out is collected. I just want to be assured as a police and crime commissioner moving forward that that is the case and that is the case in every case on the ground. And when I talk about those 20,000 devices back in February, and I know there's some excellent work, I, I just think about this here, my, my, my phone. It's really important to me, really important. Lots of stuff on there, social media, uh, work stuff. But when I think about my 19 and 17 year old, who are often gonna be the victims who have their devices taken away from them, that's more than just a phone and a handy item to have. That is their life. And I think we need to be very clear, you know, when we're dealing with this, is that this is about victims and the wider public and witnesses. And, and those three questions, I think we were asked, what, what three things? I'm just going to say one, let's put victims, witness and the wider public at the very heart of our strategy and our delivery moving forward. Um, now, I am aware that there's new legislation, the police crime courts and sentencing bill coming in and there will be some 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 stuff in there uh, around uh, taking devices, timeliness uh, and what's being looked at as well. Uh, and I'm pleased to see that we have an HMIC FRS uh, thematic review on uh, uh, the digital provision uh, that we currently have in forces. And I very much look forward to that. I just want to move on to some other another area. And this is the use of biometrics technology moving forward. So from a police and crime commissioner, my personal view, and I'm sure supported by all police and crime commissioners, that this provides uh, excellent opportunities in the future uh, for keeping our communities safe. Um, and, and indeed, you know, we should be using these technologies. But of course, you know, just because we can do something, does that mean we should do something. Now, recently I was uh, I was very pleased to be invited to go before the uh, Home Affairs Select Committee to talk on this very subject. And I just want to take you back. I, I completely agree with the use of these technologies in, in, in locking up criminals and keeping communities safe, uh, but we need to take the public with us. And I don't think we're in that place at the moment. Um, I think PCCs will call for guiding principles, whether that be in legislation or, or elsewhere. And, um, and the use of, of good independent ethics committees or panels, providing that scrutiny and oversight, um, recognising recognizing that it's the chief constable's decision in an operational context uh, to fight crime in their areas. So, as a conclusion, you know, I actually think we are at a critical time and I will go back to the start of my, my presentation when I talked back in 1985, digital forensics wasn't a thing, but we should have known it was going to be a thing. We absolutely should have known, but we were slow, I suspect. And now we know very much or part of what the future is bringing to us in relation to the size and scope of digital forensics, but also really, really importantly, the ethics and the ethical question. So the other point I would just like to make, and this is when I go back to when I took on the role of forensics lead um, at the APCC, and I'm now the APCC Forensic Lead for Police and Crime Commissioners. I, I took on this role and I did it voluntarily, and I did it 
happily. And the reason I did it is this. I am very much aware that if forensics falls down in any part, including digital, then the criminal justice system falls down. Rapists and murderers walk free from courts. There will be miscarriages of justice and confidence in the whole system will be lost. Now, we're not at that place. And I know that Nick will go on to tell us about all those things that are ongoing. But I'm really keen that everything can be done and as PCCs will want to work with policing and other partners to ensure that we've got the very best strategy uh, and processes in place moving forward, keeping our communities safe and importantly, importantly, ensuring that the United Kingdom stays at the forefront on the provision of forensics services. So thank you, Craig. Carol, thank you very much. Uh, without further ado, can I go to uh, Andy Freeburn? Andy, welcome. Uh, Police Scotland and some of the work you've been doing in Scotland. Thank you and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as I stated, I'm not Chief Constable Ian Livingstone. Um, and the disappointment doesn't end there. I'm not even Scottish. Um, but, but I am a member of the Police Scotland uh, executive team and I've recently taken up the role of ACC for organised crime, counterterrorism and intelligence after nearly 30 years of policing in Northern Ireland. So apologies from Mr Livingstone who had a, an urgent appointment to attend to. So as far as transforming policing, um, I guess being a Northern Irish police officer, I was no stranger to fundamental organisational change and was involved at uh, various ranks and roles in the huge transformation which changed the Royal Ulster Constabulary GC to the Police Service of Northern Ireland. And my observation, I guess, is that that kind of compressed change programme, which fundamentally uh, addresses culture, is not only challenging, but, but it takes time. Time to address the, the shocks created by that initial fundamental change but also for many years afterwards, the attempt to address the various tremors after that initial shock, which do actually dissipate over time, because the PSNI are 20 years along the road in that journey. Uh, Police Scotland are now not quite into their, their teenage years, and the single national service was only created nine years ago. So sometimes I think it nearly takes that generation, the 20 years or so, for the critical mass to be there, when the change actually has been so significant and fundamental. And whilst the PSNI journey that I was on was huge, I guess coming into Scotland, I have now seen how monumental the challenge was here, where 10 different policing organisations came together, 23,000 uh, people, becoming the second largest police force in the United Kingdom, across a third of Britain's landmass and some of the most rural and remote communities in the country. And I can't take any credit for this, but I can't fail to be amazed at the scale and the complexity of the challenge that was faced, which took £200 million per year out of the policing budget for Scotland, continued to reduce overall crime by 9%, increased the clearance rates uh, by nearly 5%, and maintained higher officer numbers. There's uh, 33 officers per um, 10,000 citizens in Scotland compared to an English and Welsh average of 22%. And rightly so, the statistic we're most proud of is that the latest Scottish household survey puts trust in placing at 87%. But there is still work to do and continuing to establish single systems and consistencies across local and national national portfolios in Scotland really uh, it continues to be a challenge. And my final comment about the transformational process in Scotland is that I personally believe that events such as COVID and particularly COP26 really galvanised policing across Scotland. It's hard to see um, how huge cross-cutting events of national importance could have been delivered as effectively without having a national police service in Scotland. And I certainly get the feeling that Police Scotland is an organisation really comfortable in its new skin and with its own developing um, history and, and legend. I just want to use maybe the second part of my input to talk about digital forensic, um, because in my portfolio of counterterrorism, serious and organised crime and intelligence, and, and they're all big challenges, as you would imagine, 
But I find most of my time is, or a large proportion of my time is certainly spent about talking about digital forensics. And the reason for this, as we know, is that the demand and the risk just is completely outstripping our ability to react and resource it. So in Police Scotland, the digital forensic demand has continued to increase by a minimum of 11% per year. Fraud has almost entirely moved into an online space. 95% of our fraud is online, and we know we only ever see a tip of the iceberg. And the online element is where we are now seeing the abuse of children, the exploitation of vulnerable people, and the facilitation of serious and organised crime. And it is this shift that I think is just the most challenging for policing. We traditionally, I think, been equipped for policing public spaces or even private spaces. But now the new world is clearly the virtual online space where we are, are finding greater challenges to deal with. So I just want to put my finger on two interconnected problems that I see for policing in the digital world. And the first is about resourcing. So recently in Scotland, we have added 29 people into our digital forensics. So we've increased our capacity by a third. But we also know that that will barely meet the increase in demand. And it's going to be really quickly outstripped as the demand will increase. There's more devices to be seized. There's more complexity in examining those devices and ever increasing data on devices. It's just terabyte after terabyte seems to be added in every new model of, of phone and technology. So adding more people is not going to be a long term solution. How we try to fight fire with fire and use technology to help us examine digital devices is perhaps one of the solutions, but it brings in an interconnected problem because, and, and this has already been mentioned um, by, by Daryl, um, because not only is the issue about new technology challenging for, for placing around budgets and procurement and value for money, but the main issue has been about ethics. And I wanted to share with you very briefly just an initiative that was recently rolled out in Police Scotland around cyber kiosks. And this has allowed officers to really quickly triage devices to determine whether they should be seized for further examination. But the rightful issue that arose from our police authority, from governance scrutiny, was about data ethics and very legitimate concerns that we had not in Police Scotland be as forthright or forthcoming around what we were doing, how we were doing it, what standards existed, uh, particularly around equality, privacy, proportionality. So certainly in this case, there's been very significant learning around our consultation, our engagement, and the safeguards that are in place to ensure technology is being used appropriately and particularly has the confidence of the public. And I'd be really keen to pick this up in the question and answer session. I know other speakers, I see Daryl's already mentioned it, and other speakers will, um, I'm sure, touch on this, because I do think there is already a branding uh, issue around words like machine learning, algorithms, AI, by law enforcement, I believe it's already tarnished. So we need to do things differently. And then we do things differently in Scotland. We've agreed pathways around how we consult, how we engage, how we invite challenge to our thinking. So we've data ethics panels, independent advisory groups, we've a professional reference group, and we also have a, a flagship change program on cyber with professional services support to look how we might continue to improve it. So I'm talking about kind of people and processes. I think my kind of final three is, is just about partnership. And I'm delighted to be involved with such a broad range of partners today from public private sector and trying to jointly solve this huge problem for not just policing, but for all communities. Because when I'm getting requests, and I do get requests that so we need to increase our cryptocurrency capability, we need to increase our dark web capability. And I'm thinking, do we? Or could this be done by working more closely with organisations like NCA or City of London or partners in the financial sector? Could we not try and achieve this? But I want to finish with some optimism and, and reference to Sir Craig's point about avoiding the, the a woe is me moment. Certainly in my eight weeks in, in Police Scotland, what, what encourages me is I've seen a shared understanding of the problem that we face. And they, and they say that that's half the solution. But I also see a collective will and a desire to work collaboratively in a partnership. And this needs to be integrated and probably more radical than we've ever seen before. And we now need to grab that opportunity. Police Scotland only has four strategic objectives, but one of them 
is tackling crime in a digital age. And this is really where we want to focus our efforts with the right people, the right processes, particularly around ethics, but also the right partnerships. Thank you. I'll hand back to you. Andy, thank you. Really helpful. Um, can we move on to, to, to Nick, Chief Council Nick Dean, Digital Forensic Lead for Policing? Thank you, Craig. Uh, Suzanne, I think we've got some slides uh, I need to share. Excellent. OK, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. As Craig has introduced myself, I'm Nick Dean. Uh, I'm the NPCC or the National Police Chiefs Council Lead over forensics in its entirety. Uh, and within that is the digital forensics element led by DCC Paul Gibson. Uh, and I just want to take you through a journey this afternoon, hopefully uh, not to dwell really on actually the size of the issue, but also to come up with uh, a way forward of an in innovative way forward of where the forensics portfolio uh, is going to uh, hopefully uh, make some real difference uh, to policing and also going back on the common theme here is not forgetting the communities that we serve. So next slide, please. So what what is the case for change? Well, the case for change is really clear and has been articulated this morning by the, 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 the speakers that have already uh, uh, preceded me. The proliferation of devices, the expansion of that digital st storage, and actually the actual pace of change across the digital landscape is more, uh, is faster than anything we've probably uh, experienced. Andy has already mentioned the uh, the extent to which digital uh, forensics hits most of the crimes that we now deal with. 90% uh, of crime has a digital element, and that not only in terms of the number, but also the sheer complexity and the types of device has also provided a challenge uh, for policing and the wider law enforcement agencies. When we look at the profile of uh, profile of people carrying devices or having the devices, there's a figure of 99% between 16 and 34 year olds own a smartphone. I'd probably go further than that. And they, they probably own more than one smartphone if you look at my family. And so the growth of that digital element and the expanse of which it touches everyone within our community cannot be underestimated. And then there is that important element has been highlighted again through the ethics, through the values of actually the, the, the communities we serve are increasingly aware of the key rights relating to their personal data. That, that umbilical cord to their life within their pocket is very, very important to them. And we must treat that with dignity and respect uh, as we go through any investigation. So that greater emphasis on personal data and security is really crucial to maintaining the public trust and confidence in approaching those privacy issues. Thank you. The next slide. So what is the strategic landscape? And uh, we mentioned here that it just hasn't really, it hasn't crept up on us, this digital aid, uh, this digital age. There is a number of uh, strategies, there is a number of research documents which have provided us a route map of which has, has led out this landscape of which we find ourselves within today. So policing vision recognised the fact that the public is changing the way its view of technology and its use of technology. The police, uh, the National Police Digital Strategy flagged four co uh, core digital ambitions to be achieved by 2030. And one of those was the seamless digitally enabled experience for the public for victims of crime, for the community to enhance that public trust and confidence, and also highlighted importantly, the ethical use of public data. There's been a huge amount of work done within the digital forensics uh, portfolio, uh, and the digital forensic strategy, uh, which was, was produced a short period of uh, a short time ago, identified again, based upon the community's uh, view, the scientific community's view, and identified core challenges facing digital evidence as we go forward. And that, that highlighted need for central coordination, collaboration and alignment and the use of technology as we move forward. The NPCC strategic review also highlighted, and, and I know 
Uh, so Craig, you uh, were key to this strategic review, particularly in relation to the capability network, was how to narrow down the focus of that network going forward on the real issue that surrounds forensics today, and that is around digital forensics. And then we have specifics around the rate review commissioned in June 2021, which really embedded the commitment to identify the technical gaps within the RASO environment and the case progression, working with industry to enhance that investigative process. And then finally, the RASO strategy, requirements uh, again to balance the rights of an investigator or the requirements, should I say, of an investigation with the rights to privacy. So that strategic landscape, which has been outlined back from the policing vision right the way through to today and beyond with the advent of HMI FRS's inspection around digital forensics, really keen on the horizon, then that really is at the forefront of our minds within the law enforcement arena. So what is the new approach uh, in terms of where we are going to take this? Uh, if we could move on to the next slide, please. So the digital forensics program, it's a real new innovative approach, really uh, built uh, by the Forensic Capability Network, by digital forensics portfolio, by assistance with the police digital service and Blue Light Commercial. And this was really an emphasis on the need to work closer, to bring together national organisations with that expertise and technical delivery capability to move us into a new arena going forward. And the rationale behind that was clear, not only from what we've heard this afternoon, but also from our experience across policing. That greater coordination, collaboration and consistency, that building it once, delivering it to the many has been a common theme across forensics, uh, and particularly around uh, around the digital element of that in uh, that environment, and also not to put in quick wins, to put to build an enduring sustainability change uh, that actually builds in that enduring capability as we move forward, and bring in together, drawing upon the unique capabilities each part of the landscape has, and the technical expertise and innovation that everyone uh, has to bring to this party. So in maximising that benefit as a whole system approach rather than bespoke across 43 forces across England and Wales, and as we've heard from Andy, across Police Scotland and PSNI. So what is its key principles? Well, some of the key principles I think have been articulated already. First of all, improving the trust and confidence of the community. When I say to new recruits that actually when you, you you grip that golden rail within the dock, you're very unlikely to be questioned on why you made that arrest on the street or in someone's house. What you are going to be quizzed on in terms of the trust and confidence and the accreditation of how you present your evidence is the validation and the accreditation and the continuity of evidence. And particularly within the digital element, that is the bit that we need to ensure we have got spot on. So improving that criminal justice outcome and experience for victims is really at the centre of our future. And developing the workforce, we mentioned the capability, the skills of our workforce needs to be enhanced to keep up to date with the technology and to try and be one step ahead in terms of addressing the skills gap, professionalising our workforce and then maintaining their expertise through training. Thank you. So we've had a, a huge amount for the next slide of digital uh, community engagement and beyond the digital forensic uh, engagement and community in order to gather the thoughts of what is being uh, stated out there. And that has really been extensive. Uh, criticism uh, around the forensic portfolio has been a perception of non-engagement, but I have to say, uh, coming into the forensics portfolio, I think that was a perception and actually within the digital element of the uh, the digital elements uh, portfolio, the, the expanse of the engagement has been widespread. So the scope really in terms of where we're going to is being narrowed into validation, automation and selective abstr extraction 
to ensure that over enduring capability ongoing development of the digital world. And those three elements of validation, automation, automation, selective extraction is really at the centre of where we are moving with the digital forensic programme moving forward. And you can see on the slide there the number of broad uh, experiences and views that have been expressed uh, by the community and how we need to prioritise down our thoughts. So the final slide that I present today is where are we? Well, the Home Office have set uh, a budget of 30 uh, million over the next three years for innovation within the digital forensics investment. We know because of the sheer capacity and, and the sheer scale of digital forensics, that's insufficient to address the entirety of the digital forensic science strategy that has been developed. We've gathered the priorities from the community internally and externally to policing. And we've built this initiation document, which now sits hopefully to be approved in a, in a very short time. But we want to balance that strategic and enduring capability plan with the technical expertise through police digital services, through Blue Light Commercial, through the FCN, through the digital portfolio to build some real sustainability going forward. So my belief through my work with uh, and overseeing the digital forensics portfolio and the wider portfolio of forensics is that we have got some innovation here to answer Sir Craig's view about what are the solutions here. Within the digital world, there is an exciting area of which we need to take forward and we are ready to push that button. So just to round off, when we, we talk about what are the main sort of thoughts as uh, as I go forward within the, the, the solution area, I think four key principles that I, I've worked through over any partnership uh, landscape and particularly within this complex area of forensics are four things. Uh, one is to have a clear direction, trying to make this really complex area simple, very easy to say, very hard to achieve. So having a clear direction the willingness to compromise and collaborate in terms of a work, uh, in, in terms of a, a way forward and not seek perfection at the expense of good. Whatever we build on the third element of those principles has to be sustainable and has to be enduring. And the fourth has to be that we do not compromise on our ethics or our values, either our personal ethics or values that of our organisation we represent or importantly, the communities we serve. So thank you for uh, listening to me from the digital uh, forensics portfolio across the NPCC, uh, and I'll hand back to Sir Craig. Thank you. I'm gonna just move the agenda slightly now. We've, we, uh, we've heard from uh, uh, the APCC, we've heard from the NPCC, the third part of that triumvirate is the Home Office. So I'm just going to take Bethan, because I'm also conscious you have to leave us, Bethan. So I'm gonna ask you for, for your bit. Also, um, can I ask colleagues, keep the questions coming, some good ones coming in there. Um, so keep them coming. But without further ado, Bethan Page Jones from the Home Office. Welcome. Thank, thanks very much, um, Craig, and I'm really grateful for you and the rest of my pan, um, panel colleagues um, allowing you to kind of rejig the agenda like that. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful that I've had the invitation to speak today and that I've got to share the virtual stage um, with everybody else on the panel. And apologies, I can't stay for the later discussion. I'm not running away from your questions. This is just the one day a week when I try and balance my work and life and pick my kids up from school. Um, so in terms of where we need to be and the kind of home office view. So I think the government you know, is kind of being very clear about its priorities in relation to cutting crime, whether that's tackling drugs, whether that's rolling up county lines, whether that is tackling violence against women and girls and digital forensics capabilities, as people have already said, and I'm sure the practitioners in the audience know a lot better than I do, are actually at the heart of tackling um, so many of so many of these areas. Um, the rape review, which has already been mentioned, and the work that's flowed from that has just been a case study in the kind of the vital importance of those digital forensics capabilities. And there are many reasons why we have this appalling attrition rate um, in rape cases and in bringing offenders to justice. But the delay in the intrusive nature of accessing that information from phones, as kind of Daryl has already spoken about, the challenge is actually getting it from suspects in time for it to be useful in an interview 
the managing and exploiting of all of that information to support an investigation and the effort and required for kind of lengthy manual disclosure again just highlights for one particular crime type actually how important these digital forensics capabilities are and I'm really grateful the work that the Transforming Forensics Programme have done, the FCN and the Police Digital Service are doing at the moment to tackle some of these issues. Now people have already talked about how um, how almost all crimes have a digital footprint um, and I think depending on how you see your half a glass this is either a threat because there is so much um, you know information for us to manage but it's also a massive opportunity um, and I've heard um, Cressa Dick talk about actually more more crimes should be solvable um, because there is more evidence out there there is that digital footprint but actually how can we really exploit this opportunity um, so I think there are kind of three key questions that kind of we collectively need to answer and we need to have a kind of a way forward um, in tackling these. The first, which is one that Nick's already touched on, is actually what does it make sense for us to do at national level and what are those capabilities we should be investing in at a national level? So that's kind of Craig's first capability lens. You know, from the Home Office, we're interested in the national and the central. There's obviously an awful lot of kind of work going on locally. But we do face some common challenges and there are some things which it makes sense to solve once and solve and um, kind of solve collectively. That's why we are investing in a national program. That national program is there, which Nick has talking has spoken about. I think we've just fired the spot starting pistol on Nick. Um, so let's make sure that it delivers kind of what we need. Um, so we have talked about how do we extract data in a timely way that builds the confidence of victims. How do we grapple with this challenge of that explosion of data and information? Um, and where do those technological advances, AI, automation, cloud storage, where do they help us with that with that issue? And I guess the third one is how do we get the kind of tools and products into the hands of investigators? So we know there's an awful lot of innovation in the market. I'm sure Magnet will tell us about some of the kind of fantastic things they do, but actually how do we get them in a kind of cost effective value for money way to investigators? And they've got the confidence that they're kind of robust, they're accredited, um, and that kind of links back to the standards. I think the second point is actually what's our operating model for digital forensics i think a bit to kind of craig's point is it doesn't sit in isolation i mean i'm a sort of civil servant bureaucrat administrator so i like to put things in boxes digital digital forensics confuse us it's like well, does it is it a digital thing is it a forensics thing but actually the value is combining all of our sources of data and information intelligence so bringing what we what we gather um through digital forensics alongside other sources of intelligence and again um, we kind of heard about actually there are other bodies, NCA, for example, actually, how do we start to think about um, a sustainable model of supporting investigations in policing, which blends lots of these different types of expert intelligence and analysis. And again, as others have mentioned, this operating model needs to have the confidence of the public. Data protection, ethical considerations are absolutely vital. And I think my third area where we need a kind of clear way forward and to work together is our vision for the workforce. And again, I know this is something that the College of Policing, the FCN, we've got MPCC leads for workforce, for forensics, the chief scientific advisor. Um, lots of people are thinking, but for me, it's absolutely huge. Um, I'm, I've worked for 15 years in policing, but never actually been in policing. Um, so I've never worked in a force, um, but I'm huge. I'm a kind of passionate advocate for police staff and the contribution that they bring to policing. And I'm always struck actually, if we look at the challenges policing is facing for the future, we critically rely on these specialist skills, forensics, um, you know, financial investigators, kind of data scientists, data engineers. So I think we need some kind of bold thinking about the workforce. You know how we want to recruit how we want to train how we want to retain you know is our model bring people in for a long time do we accept a a sort of slightly rolling workforce it's a highly competitive market so again being imaginative about what those career pathways might look like and as kind of craig mentioned at the beginning who do we partner with you know academia the private sector how do we get these skills and capabilities into policing in a sustained way and i think we should be we should be kind of bold and ambitious. We've got a really good pedigree um, in this country of a fantastic policing model and a great scientific legacy. I think we were the first people to combine the kind of academic approach to DNA fingerprinting with kind of police applications. You know, this is something we do really well. So again, I think thinking about the workforce and a sort of a vision for how we might grow that in this space is, is really important. So those were my kind of three areas. And I think finally, actually how we do this is really important so we talk a lot about the what but also about the how and again you know it's the value of partnership um you know working with operational practitioners with the mpcc with the apcc with the bodies that we have police digital service college of policing 
um, I kind of a couple of months ago, I got to look around one of the digital forensics vans. Um, so it's something that um, that we sort of pushed out as part of the response to the rate review. But this was something that was designed and specified by practitioners um, in Bedfordshire. So they came up with the idea. They explained how they wanted a van kitted out, something that, you know, someone of the home office would never come up with. And why would we? But actually, it is a local innovation driven by frontline professionals, which is being looked at centrally. And then it's, you know, it's implementation furthered and supported by a national programme. And for me, that's a really good example of, you know, bringing together kind of a bit of home office funding, some NPCC driving, FCN delivery, um, and the kind of that expertise um, from a local force. Um, so I think kind of just to end on the kind of the importance of us working together and collectively on this kind of events like today are really vital. We brought, we're bringing all of our perspectives together and kind of harnessing our collective expertise um, so we can kind of, depending on you know where you are, either tackling this knotty problem or actually really, really exploiting this opportunity we have um, to kind of prevent and detect crime, bring offenders to justice and protect the public. Um, so, as I say, thank you very much um, for the opportunity. I'm sorry I can't save the questions. Um, if there are a lot of things you're interested in from the Home Office, then I'm really happy to work out how we can kind of feed some of that back offline. And thank, so you. thank you, really appreciate that. And that that's helped no end. Uh, we've got quite a few questions come in. So before I want to continue with our, our, our speakers, um, and then we'll take some of the questions in terms of where we go. So without further ado, can I go to Nina, Nina Sunday from Norway, Norway uh, and the, the, the Norwegian Police University College. Welcome. Thank you for your contribution this afternoon. Thank you, Craig, and uh, good, no good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me and having the opportunity to talk to you. My name is Nina Sunde, and I'm a police superintendent with uh, 25 years of uh, experience from policing, and I'm also a PhD fellow at the University of Oslo, and currently a lecturer at the Norwegian Police University College. So what I'm going to talk about now is, is a novel area within uh, digital forensics and research on digital forensics. I would like to shed light on the cognitive and human factors involved in the digital forensic investigations, which has been the primary topic of interest in my PhD research. The ability to obtain evidence rests on, on many factors, as you already have talked about, such as expertise and tools and capacity and et cetera. And much can go wrong in this process, which may lead to loss or alteration of the evidence due to unskilled practitioners and application of inadequate or unreliable tools and methodologies. And all these physical and digital changes are referred to as evidence dynamics. So in my research, I've investigated another aspect that adds to the problem of evidence dynamics, namely the, the human factor, and more specifically, examiner bias and examiner reliability. So together with my supervisor, Dr. Etl Dror, I explored to what degree digital forensic examiners are objective and neutral during casework when exposed to information about the case and whether they produce consistent results. And this was inspired by research findings from the overall forensic science domain, where a substantial body of research from the last two decades has shown that forensic examiners are prone to a bias caused by task irrelevant information, and that they produce inconsistent results even when faced with the same task and with similar context. But none had uh, explored these issues in the digital forensics domain, and we decided to do so. So we let uh, 53 uh, digital forensic examiners from eight countries, including UK, analyze the same digital evidence file obtained from a laptop. So what did we find? In terms of cognitive bias, the research exposed that when digital forensic examiners are given information not directly relevant to their assignment, it influences the amount of traces, the number of traces they discover when reviewing data acquired from, for example, a laptop or a mobile phone. And those who got indications of an innocent suspect found less evidence than those who got indications of guilt. So this shows that context influences also digital forensic examiners in the amount or number of traces they discover and deem relevant to report, and also when they decide to stop to look for more traces. In terms of examiner reliability, which is about whether the examiners produce consistent results, we compared those who got the exact same context to one another. And the research showed a substantial variation in the amount of traces they discovered and deemed relevant to the investigation, and also how they interpreted the information and how they concluded. 
And remember that this variation was between examiners receiving exact similar information about the case. So what's the utility of this knowledge? Well, this knowledge is important because it nuances and contradicts several policies related to digital forensics that may lead the investigations astray. We tend to think about digital evidence as facts that speak for themselves and that they are not influenced by the examiner. However, the research has shown that there is much decision making and interpretation involved in digital forensic casework. And we also tend to believe that a single digital forensic examiner would find the same traces as any other other uh, examiner. But the research points actually in the opposite direction. Variation is probably the rule rather than the exception. And we tend to believe that just because almost any investigating officer can review the acquired digital content through the very user friendly analysis programs, they can also understand the limitations and uncertainties involved. But the latter requires high levels of expertise that very few actually possess. So we know that software tools from time to time interpret data erroneously and unskilled practitioners can often be un unaware and unable to validate their findings. So uh, I'm not here to launch any quick fixes on this problem today. <laughs> I guess you would hope for that, Craig. Uh, we need the research also on the possible quality measures to determine the most effective ones here. It's a very novel research area. However, I would strongly recommend that digital forensic examiners are educated in biasing sources and possible ways of preventing one-sided investigations caused by cognitive bias. Awareness is the first and probably most vital step towards mitigating biased investigations. And we need them to become aware that they are prone to bias by contextual information and many other biasing sources, and that this is not an ethical issue or nor related to their expertise. Experts are biased too. And uh, we need to develop effective ways to manage context and figure out how to be able to perform balanced investigation despite contextual influences. We need to find ways to ensure that the digital forensic examiners have the necessary information to perform a timely and targeted examination of digital evidence and at the same time avoid one sided investigations caused by contextual bias. So that concludes my introduction and thank you for your attention and I look forward to the further discussion afterwards. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And without further ado, I'll go over to, to Giles, Giles Hurdle. Thanks very much. Um, so I was asked to talk about the ethical implications of digital forensics and it's pleasing that all the other speakers I think have mentioned ethics in one sense or another. Um, so I'd just like to expand perhaps on some of the concepts that were kind of introduced a bit earlier, and particularly with reference to digital forensics being one, but not the only source of digital evidence and, uh, and data that is important for um, investigations and for policing. So um, yesterday I had the pleasure of um, hearing from Martin Hewitt, who was speaking um, at um, an event around technology and policing. Um, and he talked about kind of three pillars around policing with legitimacy being absolutely central to that alongside efficiency and effectiveness. And of course, as we've heard already, we can we can see that digital forensics is central to all of those three elements. Um, but I'd like to focus on the legitimacy issue specifically because I think it's kind of very pertinent to some of the other issues that have been raised this afternoon. Um, and the context for that, of course, is that the environment in which data is being gathered to support investigations and to answer questions is becoming increasingly complex, increasingly varied. And that means that the sources of data that need to be interrogated to answer the kind of classic operational questions of who, what, when, why, where and how that all investigations centre around require access to increasingly varied and complex data sets. Um, and that's perhaps best illustrated by some of the developments we've seen over the last kind of couple of years, um, where we've seen obviously the pandemic having a, a massive seismic effect on policing, but also on society as a whole. It's accelerated underlying trends around the movement 
of online services, uh, online activities, and the dependence across society in terms of use of those. And that's also accelerated pre-existing trends around criminality. Only today we've seen the ONS highlight the fact that over the last two year period of the of the pandemic to December 21, um, crime overall has gone up. Um, and most of that has been driven by online criminality, massive increases in cybercrime and online fraud. So they've become the kind of predominant crime types. But equally, also in that period, we saw the success, the staggering success of Operation Venetic and um, the takedown of um, the criminally dedicated secure communications platforms that was a multinational um, operation um, and that's led to perhaps the most significant law enforcement um, success against organised crime in recent memory um, and arguably ever. Um, and, and that's because um, those same organised crime groups were themselves dependent on using what they thought were secure communications, but ones that law enforcement was able to get access to and was able to therefore understand and get a huge and unprecedented range of insight into their behaviour, operations and others. But that very operation and the volumes of data that were generated by it highlight both challenges around the legal context in which data is acquired, but also challenges to do with how to deal with the complexity of those data volumes and data sets. So that means that policing needs to use more tools. It needs to, it needs to invest, as we've heard already, in more capabilities, not just to access data, but to understand data and present that data. And those tools and how they are developed and deployed, I think, is a key factor that we need to be thinking about. So what I'd like to highlight is, is issues that, were, that have come out of the recent House of Lords report on technology rules, which has looked specifically at this issue of how digital technologies are used within the justice system in the UK and, and, and the controls around those. And it highlights that report um, which came out last month and was a product of um, a number of public hearings and a lot of submissions from experts across the field in the public, private, academic and civil society sectors, um, effectively highlights um, the lack of a system for, for, these, um, for, for the adoption and development of, of these new technologies. I want to focus on four elements that come out of that. First of all, it's around the um, the institutional framework. So that's the kind of legal um, rules based institutional framework in which um, technology is developed and deployed. So whilst we have lately seen things like College of Policing guidance on live facial recognition and mobile phone extraction, that guidance has been produced after the fact, after there have been legal challenges to the development and deployment of those technologies. Um, and that's not really good enough. Um, it also highlights the fact that um, there has not been an adequate legal framework for um, the use of such technologies. And whilst there are powers and frameworks being developed within the um, within the, uh, the current policing and crime and sentencing bill, um, those are dealing with problems that have already been identified. They're not dealing with future challenges. That's an issue that we really need to address and look at systematically. And I think the central question I'd have is whose job is it to do this? Is it government's job? Is it policing's job? Is it technology's job? At the moment, there's no clarity on that. Um, but I would just put out the question that it's two years since the policing national digital and data strategy promised that there would be a national data ethics framework for policing. That data ethics framework doesn't exist yet. It's not clear who's producing it. It's not clear when it will be produced. So I'd really like to ask the question, who's responsible for this and how do we ensure these, these kind of key institutional things happen? The second element of this um, is around transparency, both in terms of requirements and solutions. This is like a classical problem, particularly in the machine learning AI space, where the whole issue of algorithmic bias is a hotly debated topic, not just in policing, but across multiple 
um, multiple sectors and multiple states. Um, I don't for a moment pretend that we've got the answers to how we solve the algorithmic black box conundrum in terms of um, how do we uh, how do we ensure that we've got transparency about algorithmic bias and use? All I would say is that there is massive and considerable expertise that's outside policing that's wrestling with these issues. And that's those are issues that policing needs to lean into, need to share those challenges, and we need to work with some of those experts who are wrestling with those very same problems outside. But transparency is definitely a two-way process in this regard. The third area picked up in the report is around human machine interaction and that links directly to the points that Nina was saying about the bias of users. So are users aware of the issues to do with the validity of results that are coming out of machines? Um, do they understand the human factors that may be influencing their decision making? And is that again transparent in the overall kind of evidential chain? Um, so whilst in this country we have um, clear requirements um, through the um, CPIA around demonstrating reasonable lines of inquiry um, and decision making around those and those have been reinforced following the RV Allen case and others. Um, how those are applied in the whole life cycle of the acquisition examination and presentation of digital evidence is a key factor um, and that 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 needs uh, needs needs further addressing. And the last point here is evaluation. Again, it links to the point um, around the fact, do we have a robust method for testing tools before they're deployed so that we know, do they work? Do they do the things that they claim to do? And do they work in an operational context, not just a lab context? Um, and do we understand the outputs that come out of them? This is a space where I think forensics has got masses of learning and insight um, to share with other areas of policing. Um, because quality standards are built into the forensic model. And I think it's an area where um, we need to be seeing more of that. And I'm really heartened by the work that's going on within um, Paul Taylor as Chief Scientific Advisors, um, forthcoming um, strategy around police science, technology and research to look at how we embed scientific decision making within the policing process. So I think there's real areas for progress here, but I would really like to underscore the importance of dealing with the who's ultimately responsible question, because without that, we've already heard about a mass of organisations involved in this space. Um, and if, if it's not clear to people on this call who's responsible for what, it certainly won't be clear to members of the public. And without that, how are we going to maintain and build public trust and confidence in this space? Thank you. Giles, thank you. Very thoughtful. Um, and colleagues, keep the questions coming in. Um, some really good ones there that link directly to where we're going in a minute. Um, but last, but by no means least, I'd like to go to Mark Lee's um, digital uh, evidence management for, for Magnet Forensics. Mark. So, Craig, thank you. And um, yeah, quite a... Uh... Quite an exciting and intimidating job to go last after such a sincerely fascinating uh, and varied panel. So, um, you know, I'd like to do my best to just speak a little bit about um, a technology vendor's perspective. Uh, I, I guess on a personal note, I would just say um, this is this is really it's actually quite inspiring and exciting to hear hear the level of discussion we've got today, the number of attendees um, we've got on the line, and, and the, the panelists. I've been involved in in police and in digital forensics since I think around 2005. Um, let me tell you at that stage, it was not easy or feasible to attract um, the types of people we have on the panel today. So that suggests we've got a lot of motivation and interest to do things better and differently, which I think is incredibly exciting. Um, I've been on this journey, you know, and seen it change, which is which is great. And today actually feels like quite a moment for me to to see the discussion and um, back then in 2005 um it was a very different world i think a lot of us have spoke about that i think andrew in particular some of the changes we've seen i think we've touched on technology ethics culture it's, it's a really interesting stuff um probably to try and take it back to a, to some degree um an operational policing level i i vividly remember the first iphone that we received into our department um, 
and I remember some number of email messages because previously I think we were limited by um, 10 previously dialed calls, 100 contacts and so on. I remember this device having something like 12,000 emails and we simply didn't have the tools or the processes or the traits to know what to do. And I think in the end we kind of batch exported it to around eight DVDs um, and we kind of threw it at the police officer because we largely perceived um, our job in that unit to be around device acquisition and extraction. And the concept of extending that through to analysis reporting, never mind through to the courts and how they could receive it in line with ethics, in line with the needs of the prosecution and a fair defence. They were really quite alien concepts. Um, and if you look at them where magnet fit in, I think one of the points I think I wanted to make, um, and I'm really involved in this personally. So for anyone who doesn't know, Magnet Forensics are a Canadian business. We were set up by a, a police officer. Um, who had some skills and experience in, in programming and things. And, you know, we're really committed. Like our mission and vision is to is to help build the tools that enable you to do your job in policing effectively. And we really are committed to trying to help with that. But the lens through which we frame everything in the last 10 or so years has been really to serve the needs of those specialist forensics practitioners. Um, and I think it has been focused more on acquisition and extraction. So to, to reflect on, on, you know, both the panel we have here today, the scale of the problems we're now seeking to solve. Um, I, I think there's actually a tremendously high amount of change required to achieve and affect that in a positive way. And we would just love to be um, part of that. We think we can help. We'd like to make a contribution. You know, that's the reason we all come to work now is because we want to help um, modernize this area of policing. So how do we do it? Well, you know, we're trying to figure it out and honestly, it's not easy. Um, two or three years ago, we split up our business or we rather we created some focus on not just the tools of today. So we make digital forensic software to help acquire and process from cloud, um, cloud stored data from mobile phones, from computers, from Apple devices, um, iOS, Windows and so on. And that's great. But, you know, we've been doing that for 10 or 15 years. And, and quite frankly, like, where has it got us? You know, we're all in this together, aren't we? So we've heard about 20,000 devices on the Channel 4 program. Um, I actually shudder to think uh, it's, it's not just the backlog. It's also um, what hidden demand and hidden capacity are we not seeing? I think we've educated our police officers and investigators to expect a threshold under which they couldn't even get this um, type of service and the benefit of that data into their investigation. If you're having to wait three months, six months, or you had applications rejected to, to have devices examined, we're effectively training people um, not to bother. And that's some of the feedback we get from, from end users as well. Um, so how can we turn this around? I've seen so much of this over the years. When it works well, digital intelligence and data from devices and associated other sources, I think it's a very fair point, Giles, um, and others, it's not just the DF data, but it's a really powerful low cost source of intelligence and evidence. So how can we tap into that in a bigger way and truly transform um, capability and capacity? We're trying to work on new solutions to do that. We're trying to do our bit. I think we've been really at the forefront of some development around automation, how we can leverage AI. Um, one of the paradigm shifts I'm seeing is, is this emergence of, of a much, the recognition of all the stakeholders involved. And for a business like ours, you know, we've been built on serving the needs of that small group of specialists, of subject matter experts around digital forensics. I think the challenge I'm now involved in is how can we take that and preserve it and build on it? because we have to still be evidentially sound. We have to still do that job incredibly well around data acquisition and processing. But the stakeholders involved now, if we are to truly affect a, a transformative um, capacity issue, you know, we have to start bringing in, for example, different methods so we can um, collect data at source without submitting it to the lab, using automation and empowering more in the agency to do that review and analysis and reporting. So we're really, really trying to look at that as a business. How can we help affect that changing capacity and capability 
our customer today cannot only be the digital forensics um, team. We have to do a better job um, together as a as a supplier and, and with policing as partners of, of really understanding who the stakeholders are, what their needs are, um, and working together. Now we're really committed to that and we're trying our best to develop some new solutions in that direction. Um, I think we should feel quite proud of what we're doing in the UK. Um, I have some mixed feelings about um, what's going on in truth. If, if we start thinking like, how can we do it? How can we do better? Um, I think Andrew said, at least we recognise the issue now here and we've got a very open and active dialogue and I think that's fantastic. Um, I sometimes personally find a challenge between the the way we need to innovate and to develop new solutions and how that can be paired with what in policing is quite a high risk um, context, isn't it? We're talking about real life investigations, people's lives. So creating innovation in the pressure of policing paired with how we historically have bought solutions as well. Um, that's something that we look at a lot. Where we feel we've made the most progress most quickly is when we've simply got started and we've got access to those end users. I think there's a whole raft of stakeholders um, going from um, investigators, analysts, prosecution, all the way through to court. We're starting to move in this direction now, is trying to really understand the need of each stakeholder whilst preserving and building the tools for the digital forensics practitioners too. So I think our business is being transformed we hope we're not part of the problem. We'd like to be part of the transformation. I think it's incumbent on us to, to kind of move for the times to help push this along, but we can only move at the speed of our customers as well. Um, so these conversations are fantastic um, points of feedback and information for us. If people think we can be doing more and we should be doing more, uh, then please tell us, we'll keep working at it. But we've got a big and growing team. Um, you know, for us, I think with the amount of change, let's all accept this is a really difficult problem. Starting is better than planning continuously, but there's some big challenges in how we pair that innovation. And I think, Sir Craig, you spoke about this. Uh, I really liked it. I think you talked about the capability, the technology and the skills, but there's also a need that the system can have the capacity it needs. And we agree with that. Um, it's a really interesting challenge for us to work on from both a software perspective um, and a process perspective too. So we're up for the change. We're going to keep working at it. Um, the three things or the ideas to help, yeah, access to pilots, access to that wide range of stakeholders. We need their time and their sincere input. Um, the challenge around balancing waterfall procurement planning, you know, plan, 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 now we must deliver. I don't think it works for the speed of change and transformation we're dealing with. I think that's a really interesting topic actually. Um, and generally speaking, how do we balance? We think we move forward faster from a technology perspective when we simply start, but policing is a very important and high risk context. How do we kind of balance that up in an appropriate way to create those right forums and environments? But I've been thrilled to hear everyone speak um, on a personal note, really excited to be part of, it feels like a real maturing of the community. I think we're going from specialist to mainstream and it's a big, big jump. It's really difficult. Um, but I think there's some great progress being made by some of the UK, you know, the FCN, the Transforming Forensics, the Fact City Forum are getting this event on today. Um, and some of the inputs I've heard today has been really inspiring. So hopefully we can contribute to the discussion. Thanks very much. 2025 policing vision is all encompassing. It's people, it's processes and it's technology. And IBM are uniquely a position to provide blueprints that help policing today but also grow and uh, deliver against those challenges as they evolve in the future. It's hard to imagine a crime today where digital evidence does not play a key role in an investigation. In fact, 90% of all crime has a digital element. The opportunity is that digital evidence growing means there's more of it, which means it can be relevant to a criminal investigation and therefore there's a higher chance of prosecution. However, the challenge is that police sources need to be in a situation where they can access that data. They need to be able to process it and examine it. IBM's point of view is a centralised, unified data management platform for digital forensics. The platform is an architecture that will enable police forces to achieve all of the benefits 
around a unified, consistent way of managing digital forensics data irrespective of locality, so data that spans multiple data silos within forces, across forces and within public cloud. And how does it do that? Well, one of the key elements is around the collection process, how the data is actually stored. IBM Data Management Platform can unify and consistently manage those data silos and multiple clouds and in doing so can consistently standardise the format in which the data is presented and shared. So for us at SCC, technology is at the heart of all transformation within the police forces. Um, we work with many multi-agency organisations. We really want the police forces to, to, to lean on us to do the things that we do well to enable them to do the things that they then need to go and do, which is to obviously focus on uh, public safety. The 2025 vision for us is really important. Um, it focuses massively on victims and witnesses' experience of, 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 of the whole process. The key is the quality, the accessibility and the accuracy of the data as well. So for us, the partnerships that we have in place with IBM um, is really leveraging uh, or giving organisations the opportunity to leverage that. We have a, a history of being able to deliver outcomes in, in policing that reduce costs, that, that increase the reliability of those, those outcomes and, and do them at, a, at a, a speed that makes a real difference to policing. So if we, if we imagine uh, the life cycle of, from, from collecting that data uh, by the uh, digital forensic unit and sharing those insights with a investigatory uh, team and passing that data, uh, all those insights then through to the Crown Prosecution Service, um, to, the, uh, to the court system, and leading through to a prosecution. The time between collecting that, data, that digital forensics data and being able to prosecute a case successfully is dramatically reduced. 